We are living in a great industrial age. Everywhere we see the evolutionary forces working great changes in the method and manner of living, and rearranging the relationships between men in the ordinary pursuit of life, liberty, and a living. This is an age of organized effort. On every hand we see evidence that organization is the basis of all financial success. And while other factors than that of organization enter into the attainment of success, this factor is still one of major importance. This industrial age has created two comparatively new terms. One is called capital and the other labor. Capital and labor constitute the main wheels in the machinery of organized effort. These two great forces enjoy success in exact ratio to the extent that both understand and apply the golden rule philosophy. Despite this fact, however, harmony between these two forces does not always prevail, thanks to the destroyers of confidence who make a living by sowing the seed of dissension and stirring up strife between employers and employees. During the past fifteen years I have devoted considerable time to the study of the causes of disagreement between employers and employees. Also, I have gathered much information on this subject from other men who likewise have been studying this problem. There is but one solution which will, if understood by all concerned, bring harmony out of chaos and establish a perfect working relationship between capital and labor. The remedy is no invention of mine. It is based upon a great universal law of nature. This remedy has been well stated by one of the great men of this generation in the following words. The question we propose to consider is exciting deep interest at the present time, but no more than its importance demands. It is one of the hopeful signs of the times that these subjects of vital interest to human happiness are constantly coming up for a hearing, are engaging the attention of the wisest men, and stirring the minds of all classes of people. The wide prevalence of this movement shows that a new life is beating in the heart of humanity, operating upon their faculties like the warm breath of spring upon the frozen ground and the dormant germs of the plant. It will make a great stir, it will break up many frozen and dead forms, it will produce great and in some cases it may be destructive changes, but it announces the blossoming of new hopes and the coming of new harvests for the supply of human wants and the means of greater happiness. There is great need of wisdom to guide the new forces coming into action. Every man is under the most solemn obligation to do his part in forming a correct public opinion and giving wise direction to popular will. The only solution for the problems of labor, of want, of abundance, of suffering and sorrow can only be found by regarding them from a moral and spiritual point of view. They must be seen and examined in a light that is not of themselves. The true relations of labor and capital can never be discovered by human selfishness. They must be viewed from a higher purpose than wages or the accumulation of wealth. They must be regarded from their bearing upon the purposes for which man was created. It is from this point of view I propose to consider the subject before us. Capital and labor are essential to each other. Their interests are so bound together that they cannot be separated. In civilized and enlightened communities they are mutually dependent. If there is any difference, capital is more dependent upon labor than labor upon capital. Life can be sustained without capital. Animals, with a few exceptions, have no property and take no anxious thought for the morrow, and our Lord commends them to our notice as examples worthy of imitation. Behold the fowls of the air, he says, for they sow not, neither do they reap nor gather into barns, yet our heavenly Father feedeth them. The savages live without capital. Indeed, the great mass of human beings live by their labor from day to day, from hand to mouth. But no man can live upon his wealth. He cannot eat his gold and silver. He cannot clothe himself with deeds and certificates of stock. Capital can do nothing without labor, and its only value consists in its power to purchase labor or its results. It is itself the product of labor. It has no occasion, therefore, to assume an importance that does not belong to it. Absolutely dependent, however, as it is upon labor for its value, it is an essential factor in human progress. The moment man begins to rise from a savage and comparatively independent state to a civilized and dependent one, capital becomes necessary. Men come into more intimate relations with one another. Instead of each one doing everything, men begin to devote themselves to special employments. 
and to depend upon others to provide many things for them while they engage in some special occupation. In this way, labor becomes diversified. One man works in iron, another in wood. One manufactures cloth, another makes it into garments. Some raise food to feed those who build houses and manufacture implements of husbandry. This necessitates a system of exchanges, and to facilitate exchanges, roads must be made and men must be employed to make them. As population increases and necessities multiply, the business of exchange becomes enlarged, until we have immense manufactories, railroads girding the earth with iron bands, steamships plowing every sea, and a multitude of men who cannot raise bread or make a garment or do anything directly for the supply of their own wants. Now we can see how we become more dependent upon others as our wants are multiplied and civilization advances. Each one works in his special employment, does better work because he can devote his whole thought and time to a form of use for which he is specially fitted, and contributes more largely to the public good. While he is working for others, all others are working for him. Every member of the community is working for the whole body, and the whole body for every member. This is the law of perfect life, a law which rules everywhere in the material body. Every man who is engaged in any employment useful to body or mind is a philanthropist, a public benefactor. Whether he raises corn on the prairie, cotton in Texas or India, mines coal in the chambers of the earth, or feeds it to engines in the hold of a steamship. If selfishness did not pervert and blast human motives, all men and women would be fulfilling the law of charity while engaged in their daily employment. To carry on this vast system of exchanges, to place the forest and the farm, the factory and the mine side by side, and deliver the products of all climes at every door, requires immense capital. One man cannot work his farm or factory and build a railroad or a line of steamships. As raindrops acting singly cannot drive a mill or supply steam for an engine, but collected in a vast reservoir become the resistless power of Niagara, or the force which drives the engine and steamship, like mighty shuttles from mountain to sea coast and from shore to shore, so a few dollars in a multitude of pockets are powerless to provide the means for these vast operations, but combined they move the world.